Okay, guys. So we left off before chapter 12 with the coronation of the first king of Israel, which is Saul, which, remember, the, the, the story leading up to Saul, starting with chapter 9 of 1 Samuel, 10, 11, 12 is tonight, but uh, 9, 9, 10, and 11, we have just some amazing things that happen with Saul, confirmations, prophecies, all kinds of incredible things, and then we have kind of two confirmations of his, king, of his, of his kingship, which take place both amongst the Israelites and then after a battle. They have a battle against the Ammonites, they destroy the Ammonites, and everyone's like, this is it. This is our guy. Who was saying terrible things about him? Bring them out now. But the point is, we're in a transition phase right now. Let's do a little show of hands here. Do we have any people in the room that are leaders that have ever had to transfer the baton to someone else, to the next group of leader, the next generation or something like that. Anyone in this room ever have to pass that along? Kind of, sort of. I'm seeing a lot of military similarities here. Okay. So this is exactly what we have right here. We have Samuel, Sam, Samuel's farewell address before Samuel is out of the story. There's going to be things that Samuel continues on with, but we have this farewell address here and it really is kind of a marker of a transition from the series of judges that the Lord has used to deliver Israel into this new system, into this monarchy, into this kingdom that is now going to be different than how it was. You'll see some similarities, but there's also going to be a difference here. And he transitions well. And one of the things we have to remember as leaders is that, well, I'm just going to say this. For everybody who's in ministry and everyone who's the head of a ministry, a leader in ministry, what business is it that we're in? We're in the business of the kingdom of God. That's our business. It's not, I'm in the Calvary Chapel cleaning ministry or usher ministry or kitchen ministry or nursery. I'm in the business of the kingdom of God. That's the ministry that we're in. That's the, that's the position that we're in. When we transition out, and we will always have these transitions until the Lord comes. We always transition out knowing that Jesus is the head, that Jesus is the one who we're all under. There's not a head of anything that's not under the Lord. Everything is the Lord's kingdom, and he is the head of all these things. And we see this consistently even in the Old Testament. Samuel knows his place. Samuel even will start off here by saying, Indeed, I have heeded your voice. And that word there is the word Shema, which is the same word where we see in Deuteronomy chapter 6, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Super, super important. And that word here is the word Shema, which is the idea of listening and obeying. Spoiler alert, we're going to see that theme in these chapters and all of the 66 books. So he says, I did listen, I did hear and heed your voice in all that you said to me and have made a king over you. And now there is a king walking before you and I am old and gray headed and look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. And if you remember the story of Samuel, which I know was I don't even know. Was that spring that we started this? If you remember the story of Samuel, Samuel has been in the public eye for a long, long time, right? Um, we have any uh, kids that were born and raised into the church here tonight? Anyone? Actually, if you're not even a kid, how many people here were born and raised into the church? Show of hands. We got some hands that are working. It looked like it was nearly half of our group tonight, right? I've always been in the church. There's some interesting things when you've always been in the church, right? Well, it gets really interesting when you are in a position that is drawing the attention, we'll just say, of a lot of eyes. 
And this is the position that Samuel has been in from when he was a really, really little guy. Mom weans him, and then from that point on, this is his position. This is the place he's been in. And he is able to say this. He starts off, here I am, guys. Like, I, I'm going to stand here before you, and we're going to talk. We're going to be straight with each other. Witness against me before the Lord. For those of you who are students of this interesting way that I do things, that box that's up there, um, the live stream probably sees a yellow box. Ours is not so yellow. But the box right here under witness, every time you guys see a box tonight, little bonus, this is going to be a Hebrew imperative verb. Imperative verb. That means it is a command. This is not, he was running to the store. This was go run now, right? So it is a command. And he says, witness against me before the Lord. I'm commanding you now to be a witness of everything that you guys have seen. And before his anointed. His anointed is who? Do we remember? Saul. The person who he just anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? And that Hebrew word indicates violation and deception and defrauding somebody. Who have I done this with? Because if you guys remember, this has been a problem. In Israel. This has been a problem with the other priests that have been taken out before him. And he's saying, who have I done this with? Whom have I oppressed? That word means to crack in pieces, literally, to break, bruise, crush, and discourage. Who have I done that to? Or from whose hands have I received any bribe? Remember these, these words here, with which to blind my eyes, I will restore it to you. So something I was thinking about here, um, I don't know that anybody in this room is really in such a position that they're getting bribed or getting bribed often, right? Like that's just maybe not this crowd tonight. But I mean, just think about the math here on this. I bet people in this room have had people who have tried to manipulate and persuade and sway them, right? And this could have been done with lies, but it very, very often happens with something that we refer to as gossip. So I'm going to gossip about a person, right? And the idea of that is manipulation, perverting justice towards that particular person or character. And what he's saying is, in all the things that would be in the area that I've been called to, I have not compromised. And if I have, let me know so I can restore it to you. And, and just a quick little side note, I will say this. Again, we, we talk about leadership again. Um, something to think about with leadership also is if you are in a role of leadership with your family, right? You could be someone who has children, and so there's leadership there. You can have other roles of leadership in your family. But one of the things that happens sometimes with leadership, I would almost say for me, certainty, is you either A, you disappoint someone, B, you hurt somebody. Even if you don't mean it, even if you didn't know you said it or that it happened, there can be some transgression. And Samuel is saying, even if these things, like, I, I don't know about these things, I will restore them to you. Like, make it known. So his heart is in a place of total transparency. He's coming forward, and he's wanting to discuss this with them because he's going to give accounts here. They said to him, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. I think that we might overlook that really quickly. And we can certainly appreciate the significance, the depth in which a nation 
can say that about a leader, right? I, I'm not going to get into politics, but that's a, that's a tall order today. But, but let's take it away from that because I don't like getting into that. And let's just look at this and see if these words would match up the same if we were in a room with everybody that we knew, like Samuel was. All of our friends, all of our family, all the people we're in church with and ministry with and, and coworkers and all that kind of thing. And everyone would be able to say, you have not cheated or oppressed. You haven't taken anything from any man's hand. This is great integrity. Then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand and they answered, he is witness. So we're all on the same page, we're all confirmed. Then Samuel said to the people, starting with verse six, it is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still. There's our command. We see that verb right there? He's giving them a command. Stand therefore, that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all of the righteous acts the Lord which he did to you and your fathers. So he's basically going to go over, and honestly, this is a really brief list, the goodness of God. Here is the character and nature of the God that you serve. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor. So like I said, he covers a lot of ground really fast. We went from Moses and Aaron in Egypt coming out of Egypt, forgetting the Lord their God. And then when they were finally sold into the hand of Sisera, this is in Judges 4.2. So we go from the beginning of Exodus all the way to Judges 4.2. That's all covered right here. But, big but here. With everything that we just went over, right? This here in the red, I'm going to make it a different color now. This word forgot. This is the word, it's not the same as forsake, and we'll see that later. This is to mislay. And I was like, mislay? Um, I haven't used that in a sentence in a hot minute. But it literally means to place something where it doesn't belong. What they had done with the Lord was they placed the Lord where the Lord was not supposed to be placed. Exodus 1, Judges 4. I'll, the best way I can sum up so much of tonight is the Lord takes massive, giant concepts, sins, accountability, and he simplifies it into some very, very simple things. All that happened, the totality of everything that happened is they've misplaced me. And so as a reminder to that, I brought them into the hands of one of their enemies, the commander of the army of Hazor, and then into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Let's just pause there for a second. One of the nice things, uh, truly, really, well, let me just be very honest with you guys. One of the nicest things about my job, one of the easiest things about my job, is I know God is always right. That's my starting point, right? So when I read some verses and I read how the Lord allowed the enemies to come in and to have their way with God's people, this one and this one and this one. Because I know the character of God, because I know of the qualities and the attributes of God, because I know of his ways, I don't have to jump to conclusions that are not true. That's really important. So as these things are happening, which are not small matters, 
We know that through all these things that God is working these things for good. Well, what does that mean for us? There's probably things that have been the biggest challenges of your entire life that really, and, and I don't mean this in any hurtful way, I think you'd know that, but they wouldn't necessarily compare to the occupation and even some of the wars and atrocities that Israel has faced, the, the enslavement with Egypt and, and, and so many things that they have faced. It's a big deal to us. And it's enough to maybe shake our faith a little bit. And what the Lord is trying to do with all these things is this conclusion right here. Again, we're, this is simple. This is the Lord's discipline of those who he loves. They cried out to the Lord and he said, we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the bowels and the asterisks. And I'm going to pause right there because like I said before, this is not the same word as the word earlier. This word forsaken, this is not to mislay, misplace something. Now this word means I'm going to loosen something. I'm going to permit this to be so. This is choice. I am choosing something else. Now, they recognize this is everything right here. We have sinned. This is the same thing that Jesus enters into the kingdom with. Repent and believe. We have to change our mind from what we were doing, from how we were forsaking God, how we were choosing to loosen and to permit and to relinquish and leave that place that he had us at, wherever that is. And, and here's something that works really nice and universal. Everyone in this room is at a particular place with God. Everyone in this room is making decisions consciously and even subconsciously sometimes that have to do with where they stand with God and that closeness, that communion with the Lord. So everything that we're going over now in regards to Israel what does the Lord want me to see here? What does the Lord want me to know? What is he teaching me thousands of years later from this? It says, but now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent, we're going to go over some interesting names here, Jeroboam, who we believe is actually Gideon. Baden, who we believe is actually Barak, Jephthah, and then Samuel, which is interesting. This is why I have a question mark next to this one. And I can see it a little bit. So it's just a technicality. Um, these first, the, the third one right here, number three, this is one of the judges, right? Jeroboam, we think this is a judge, Gideon, and Baden, it would make sense. This is a scriptural error um, uh, a copyist error, and it's actually talking about Barak. And I'm down with Samuel saying, and Samuel, I'm okay with that. But there are some people who think this actually was a copyist error also, and it's referring to Samson. And here's what I'm going to say about that. I don't think this is the area that the Lord is wanting us to focus on tonight, right? It's not like, well, was it, and is it, and how does that change things? What we know is this, the Lord sent people to provide answers for their cries. The Lord had a plan for their deliverance. This is what matters. And so he delivered you out of the hands of your enemies on every side. Isn't it nice when we've got so many different things that are going on and then suddenly everything's okay. Everything is calm. Sometimes we have a really tough season where we're just getting hit from every angle. And to have one thing resolved is nice. What the Lord is showing here is you've, <laughs> I orchestrate some of these things. I arrange it so that you're overwhelmed in your ways. You need my protection. And then when the Lord 
restores his people. He restores it from every angle, every direction. There's peace here. And you dwelt in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us. Okay, now it's getting personal right here. This right here, this is the present. And not only is this the present, but he is, look at this next line right here. When the Lord your God was your king. You know, right before I left for vacation and I was going over some of this, and, th and, and this is where Samuel was like, guys, this is what the Lord has done. And they're like, yeah, we still want a king. I actually, I had a moment up here when I was like, keep it together, keep it together, to keep it together. Because this was so hard for me to process. And Samuel hits the nail on the head so perfectly. You were asking for a king when the Lord was your king. And now, here is your king, whom you have chosen and on whom you have desired, requested, and demanded. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. The, the, this is another thing that I was wrestling with, right, when we went over this back then. Even though they have asked for this thing and Samuel's incensed about it and, and the Lord's like, listen, Samuel, don't take this personally. It's not you they've rejected. It's me they've rejected. In spite of all that, the Lord did so many things for Saul. And, 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 and things that it still blows my mind. Why is, it when, why is it when people aren't doing the right thing, God still blesses sometimes? You know, sometimes we read about how God does bring discipline right? He does bring judgment. And yet, God also does some really, really mind-blowing things, really gracious and loving things. I am thankful that I am a parent who can understand that to some degree. I can understand to some degree how children can become rebellious, disobedient, wayward. And it can cause some sleeplessness, it can be really hard and really challenging, and you'll never stop loving him. And ours is finite, ours is corruptible, ours is not his. And so to, I mean, it really doesn't surprise us when we see God blessing those who have been sinning. But he keeps on trying to restore things back to what he's made them to be, right? And so that's one of the questions for us still today. Lord, what have you made for things to be? What have you made for me? What have you made for my life? What is it this season that it's supposed to look like that you want it to be? And then we get into verse 14. He's going to give us really good news. And he's going to keep it super simple. If big if, if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. Four things. Four simple things. Not a college doctrinal level degree of what is all this about? What does he want me to do? It's all in one verse. And it's four simple things. So the first thing we'll talk about is fearing the Lord. What does he mean by this fearing the Lord? To regard with fear, mingled with respect and affection, to venerate, to revere, to honor in estimation. Fear of the Lord can be a challenging thing, and honestly, we can do a whole night on just the fear of the Lord, but that's a summarization of it. Serving him, obeying his voice, and not rebelling against the commandment of the Lord. There's something to be said in all of this 
about going through the motions and missing the Lord in the process of it. But here's what I'm going to say. I think the way that the Lord would really truly intend for us to fear him would not be lacking. I think this is why it starts off with this. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. Because if we have that, if we have this regard to really esteem him, to have that place, I mean, have we become casual with God, you know? When things get real, when things get scary, I think that we return to that posture with the Lord. And sometimes the good times can be some of the biggest challenges that we face. Um, I'm not going to ask for anybody to raise their hands or anything. It's really personal. But being in the position that I'm in and being able to love some of the people in our family really closely allows me to see how close the Lord is to those who are brokenhearted. How close he is to those who are restored in repentance. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I'll even use myself as an example. When things are going really well, sometimes I get way out ahead of the Lord. Way out ahead. Now, if I am fearing him, if I am in that place where my whole world and, and my soul has been centered on who he is, that proper veneration. Well, serving him is beyond an honor. What are you talking about? How do I even get to do this? And it's not a check mark. It's not a box. Obeying his voice is one of those things that will never get, well, we're never going to outgrow this. We're never going to outgrow, Lord, I'm listening. I'm listening and I'm ready for what you have for me. And if the answer is always yes, my dear brothers and sisters, if everything the Lord always presents, if the answer was always yes and amen, like that song, then I think that we would probably save ourselves a lot of trouble. And we would really get to know God, even when the thing that he's calling us to may not make sense, or when our flesh is maybe screaming for us to go in another direction. And this comes down to trusting the Lord. But if we rebel, which God has seen from us from the very beginning, right? If we have that rebellion against the Lord and we get to the place where we're putting off his commandments. And, and just think about that. I mean, so tonight I highlighted imperative verbs, this is one of the most simple ways to observe the things that God is calling us to. I actually have it in my software so that I have filters on it so that every time there's a verb, it's yellow. So it's like, ooh, actions are happening. But every time it's an imperative verb, there's a box around it. It's actually a double box. I want to pay attention as closely as I can to those little nuances that I might have missed if I was just reading over it. So I have this especially set up so I can really pay attention. Continuing and following the Lord. It sounds like a really simple thing. For those of us who have been in this walk for a little while now, if we could just take a moment, really seriously pause, and think about the people who are no longer here, the people who are no longer walking, the people who are gone from this. This is not just a simple thing. And I can't imagine how many people we have here who have had worn out knees in prayer for their loved ones and for the people that have become wayward and strayed in these areas. There's a person who was facing an impossible scenario in a, a, an Olympic marathon where he uh, dislocated his knee in a fall, terrible accident. He finished the marathon hours later. This is one of those like sermons that if you've been around for a while, you've heard this sermon. But he finished the marathon hours and hours later. Like people were gone. And someone said to him, why did you finish it? 
And he said, my country did not send me to start a race. My country sent me to finish a race. There's, not a, there's a lot of people who aren't with us today. I've been in youth ministry for over 20 years. The majority of those kids are not with us today. If you do these four things, you'll continue. And, and just for clarification, really quick, really quick for live stream and history and annals and all that, I'm not necessarily talking about CCOKC, right? We're talking about the church, right? Okay. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, if you don't do this, but you do rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you. One of our themes tonight is simple. Four things to do. Two things not to do. That's it. As it was against your fathers. Uh, verse 16. Now, therefore, some more commands, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. Perceive and see. Command. But here's the interesting thing about this command. I was really kind of thinking about this and I was looking at this. God wants us to know. He is setting this up to say, I want you to see. I want you to understand what's gone wrong. Search me and know my heart, Lord. Right? It takes some real courage to pray that for real. Guys, if we're not praying it for real. This is a command. This is the Lord saying, my people, I want you to perceive this. I want you to see this. This is one of those commands that falls under, don't rebel against my commands. So the Lord is calling us out to that scary place where we will be made known, where he will show us the things that are necessary for us to see and to perceive and to comprehend that he wants correction on, but it's only because he loves us. It's only because he's good. When I, when I am talking to those who are young, right? When I'm talking to teenagers, there's a lot of things that they don't get about parents. And so when I'm talking to those who are parents, this is a much more simple thing for us to understand. Like we want our children to know the things that we want for them are good. It's not against them. We want things that are good for them. Love corrects. And God is trying to correct in the most simple of ways. But he doesn't want us to be afraid of coming to him for correction. He wants us to have that proper fear of who he is. But not of being corrected by him. We should have fear by taking up sin and thinking that we can do so. Because our father who is loving won't intervene. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. Um, I have written here, not immediate, because I think, for me, sometimes I want that immediate kind of like, right here, right now, I want to I wanna see it. But the thing that was asked here for in regards to the harvest, I'm trying to think of a really plain way to say it. It did not rain during the harvest time. All right, so for him to ask for that would not be too dissimilar with the idea that today he would say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that the Lord, this is of the Lord, and I'm going to ask for the Lord to make it snow in August. Like it had that kind of clear message. But honestly, maybe even a little more so, because if it snows in August, right, I don't know how much that really interferes. That might actually be a huge blessing for all of us. Rain in Israel at the time of the harvest, not huge blessing, right? This is like, first of all, inconceivable, like snow in August, but then on top of that, it's not good. It's just bad for the whole business. And this is what happened. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servant to the Lord your God, 
that we may not die, for we have added to all of our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. And before we go any further, if I'm in the position of trying to see them come to the right place, this is a great statement. They've realized what they've done. They've realized the sin of asking for a king when God was their king. Samuel said to the people, oh, man. So this whole section right here, good news. I have good news, says Samuel. Do not fear. You have done all this past wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all of your heart. Um, there's so much of the gospel that's right here, right? You've done all of this wickedness. God knows it all. He even knows the stuff that I don't know as a prophet. God sees it all. He knows it all. But here's what he wants you to know. Do not turn aside from following the Lord. And so since we're having a little bit of a theme tonight about people who were with us and are no longer with us, I can tell you, and, and maybe you guys can concur. Give me a nod if you can concur if, this, if you've been here before. You're sharing hope with someone. You're sharing the gospel with a person who has already known the gospel, right, and walked away from the gospel. And they have said something like this. It's too far. I've come too far. You don't know what I've done. But what God says is don't fear. Don't even allow those things to come into your mind. You've done those things. They're in the past. Now, don't turn aside from following the Lord. Serve the Lord with all of your heart. Do not turn aside, for then you will go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. I don't know everybody here, and I'm not presuming to judge erroneously. But I think it's safe to say we all go after empty things, right? This is what an idol is. It's something that replaces the place that the Lord would have for us. That goes back to that new word that maybe, maybe it's just new for me. But that word mislay. I have misplaced something. I have placed the right thing in the wrong place. And now I have the wrong thing in the wrong place. I've gone after empty things. This is as simple as it is. Don't turn aside because that's going to happen. And so the Lord might be speaking to all of us tonight. Come back. Come back from those empty things. Come back to the things that are not empty. I am not empty. I am the good news. Come back. These things are nothing. Oh, a side note that I had on this. This is what I usually try to help people. Um, I, I use this simple phrase. What is going to matter in 10,000 years? Right? What in your life is going to matter in 10,000 years? What hobby, what interest, what passion, what pursuit, all the things that are going on in your life? Because the reference of 10,000 years is just, what is it? It's eternity, right? That's beyond here. It's just something that's beyond our scope and span of this life. Because we might think like, oh, I love this. I could do this for the rest of my life. Well, this matter then. There are some things that we can be about today that will matter in 10,000 years. And then there's everything else, which just won't make it. It's going to burn. It's not going to have the place... And, and this is why the Lord is saying, these are empty things. They're not eternal. And sometimes they're just straight up imp imposters. It's a counterfeit. And the Lord doesn't want us to have counterfeits. Just like as parents, we don't want our kids to have counterfeits. We don't like lies for the ones that we love. I'm going to say something here for just a second. Because we may have kids, but we may have spiritual kids, Right? the ones that we've taken under our wing, the ones that we've walked and helped nurture this faith, answering questions, laboring over them. And 
we sure don't want to see them get caught up with counterfeits, just like our own kids, because we love them. Verse 22 says, For the Lord will not forsake his people because of his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Wow. So we have someone who's not, he's, he's talking with people who have really just messed up, right? And I think we all have been there before where we're talking to somebody who has made a mistake, messed up. But his message is, I'm not going to stop praying for you. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you the good and right way. Brothers and sisters, a serious moment from me personally. We need to take this to heart. We need to continue praying for people. We need to come alongside them and teach them the good and right way. This is the way that Jesus showed us. This is what the church is called to. This is not the same thing as being in a service and sitting and, and being part of the attendance. This is the active body that is ministering to people the good news continuously. And this is something that we are all called to. Amen? Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart. Keeping it simple again. Fear the Lord. Serve him in truth with all of your heart. That's not going to end up checking a box. This is exactly what Deuteronomy 6 is about. This is exactly what Jesus said is the most important thing. Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Simple. Guys, isn't it great that a God we will never, ever, ever begin to come to the end of, will never stop learning, keeps it so simple for us I need that. <laughs> um, sometimes you get up here and you had the kind of day where you feel like you fell off a tree and hit a lot of branches on the way down. Sometimes you have those days. And sometimes there's no pulpit involved, but you've been messing up for a while. And then the Lord brings about a person and a conversation where you're sharing the good news. Actually, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to close this verse out, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out with a situation and a story. Yeah, it's just 12. That's what we're doing tonight. For consider what great things he has done for you, but if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. And I just wrote fair, right? Like, is that fair? All right, so here's, here's the situation I was in. <clears throat> Probably a good idea to call you guys back up here at this point. So we'll, we'll have the worship team come back up. And I was in a situation where I, uh, I got discouraged. You ever, like... I don't get discouraged too often. When I do, I hit the discouragement iceberg, right? It's probably, if I'm, if I'm looking at the full time elapse, I would say every three years or so, something like that, I hit one of those things that I don't come out from easily. And I had a situation a couple of years back where I, I got hit with one of those. And I was just, I was just in my mess. I was just really pitiful. 
And, I, and this is the place I was in. God, I'm not doing anything extra. I'm not pouring my heart and soul into this and that. I'm pulling back because it burned me, right? I got burned. I'm done. I'm pulling back. I'm just going to do what I need to do. That's it. And then, true story, the most intoxicated person who has ever come into this building walked in that day. It was a mid midweek thing, and this person walked in and um, slurring and bleh, all, all kinds of stuff. And I'm not at my peak. I'm not Christian ready to save the world. I was actually behind the cafe, and my attitude is, what is this? What do you want? Because I'm not in the mood today. And, and to be honest, we get a lot of people. We get a lot of traffic in here who are um, 39th Street, the expressway here. Um, a lot of transients, a lot of drugs, a lot of things, a lot of things. Um, they come in here, we minister, right? We, we, they come in here and sometimes they're like, I need this, I need that, I need a car, I need my rent, I need a new... Th and we're like, I hear you. That's not the business we're in. We're in a different business, but I'm here for the business that we're in. We'll, we'll commune with you and we'll see what the Lord wants to do. Anyway, this guy comes in and I was kind of feeling like I'm not open for this business today, okay? And blah, 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 he's saying stuff and then he says this. And he goes, all right, well, I'm gonna get out of here and drive off. And I heard that and I went, no, you're not. You can't do that. And he goes, yes, I can, I got my keys. And you know, he's doing all that. And I said, listen, if you leave right now, I'm gonna call the police. You know what I remember? This was actually a Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. We had service that night. And I said, well, here's what you need to do. You need to stay in our parking lot or I will call the police. You need to stay in the parking lot until you sober up. And he agreed. Okay? He agreed. So he parks his car kind of far in the parking lot. And he asked for a coffee. I remember the audacity. <laughs> So he, he said, uh, can I get a coffee then or something like that? And I said, what do you want? And he told me what he wanted. I said, okay, I'll bring it to you. So I make the coffee and I walk out there all the way to the end of the parking lot. I walk out there and I was going to hand it to him through the window and go later. And he was coughing and something like that. And and I just felt like the Lord was calling me to sit in his car with him. And I went, fine. And so I went around and I sat in his car. His car was almost in the same state that he was in, if that makes sense. So I go in his car and I sit in his car and, and I give him his coffee and then I'm just there. And then he's having this verbal diarrhea of everything that's been going on in his life. and and God and all kinds of stuff. And I'm just there and I'm listening to everything. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, something kicked in, something happened. I couldn't just listen anymore. And I started ministering to this guy. And, um, and we talked for a long time, talked for a long time. And I still wasn't in a good place, right? With all this going on. And I remember after that, he asked for another coffee. And I said, all right, I'll be back. And so I got out of the car and I'm trying to walk away. And I remember just like, God wasn't being fair, right? I said, no, God, right? And God just put me in this position or I couldn't say no. Not because of anything except for the Lord's love for this guy that thankfully, even though I wanted to shut that valve off, I couldn't ignore it. And the Lord had nothing but love for this guy. And he wanted him to sober up in there and he didn't want him to drive off and he didn't want all these different things. But he was doing, a, I dare say, a bigger work in my own heart. And it's like sometimes when 
when we want to say enough, Lord, I can't anymore, I'm done. The Lord's like, no, no, I know this is hard. I'm with you, I see, I love you, but I'm going to give you everything that's necessary so that you are able to continue because I am the author and I am the finisher. It's not you. You're too weak for all that. I'm the one who's going to bring and see this whole thing through. And that's what we see. Samuel sharing super simple Israel. Fear the Lord your God. Obey his voice. Follow his commandments. Fear him in truth. Don't rebel. And don't disobey him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you don't listen to us sometimes. That you're a God who loves more than our requests. That you have a bigger plan, a bigger picture. That you've called us to so much more. I pray, Lord, that tonight that we can commune with you and that we can see what you want us to see. I ask that you would speak to us and make things clear. At the same time, Lord, we want to thank you and worship you for your long suffering, for your steadfastness, because you are such a good father. In Jesus' name, amen.